FOMO. I've talked to scientists who use AI to census penguins in Antarctica to figure out nuclear fusion uh, in a much more, in a way that never could have happened with our previous capacity. It, it's hugely exciting, but just like anything else, right? A, a blade or a flame can either heal you in the hands of a surgeon or, or burn your house down or take your wallet. I'm Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd when they should be blazing a trail of their own. But if you want to achieve greatness in business and life, you've got to break free. Come on, I'll show you how. This is FOMO Sapiens, where we explore how entrepreneurial thinkers find the inspiration and the courage to build exceptional lives. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for entrepreneurial thinkers. Now, we have, coming up next week, Earth Day. And so I thought it'd be appropriate to talk a little bit about climate. You know, taking bigger swings is impossible if there's no Earth. I mean, I guess you go to space to do it, but that's not ideal. So that is why I have a really good guest to talk about his new book called Life As We Know It Can Be, stories of people, climate, and hope in a changing world. And that guest is Bill Ware veteran journalist, anchor, writer, producer, and host who joined CNN in 2013 after a decade of award-winning journalism at ABC News. He is actually CNN's first chief climate correspondent. And if you watch the channel, which I do occasionally, you will see he's covering stories about climate from all over the world. He also has a show called The Wonder List with Bill Ware, which is now streaming on Discovery+. Plus. So just a total FOMO sapiens. He's reported from all 50 states, and interestingly, over a hundred countries. But of course, I wanted to ask him about that a lot, but I started by asking him the question. I always ask our guests when we get started, and the question is this, tell me something unexpected you learned about yourself that changed everything. Wow, well, that's a good one. And it, it actually came sort of in, in writing this book. You know, most of my life, I came from a very transient, crazy gypsy youth and moved all over. And then in, as a journeyman journalist, I've never lived in one place uh, very long. And I used to believe in the adage that a rolling stone gathers no moss. But it turns out that moss is a really good indicator of a healthy ecosystem. And we need moss, we need community. We need to be mossier in a time of national division. And the communities that trust each other the most, uh, you know, I've, I've visited some of the happiest, healthiest societies in around the world. And a universal factor in all of them, it's the number of people you can hug on a given day. It's the number of people who will knock on your door if you don't show up at church. It's the number of people you could hand your child to in an emergency. And as an introvert and kind of a lone wolf, I realize I need a lot more moss in my life at this stage. And so I'm trying to impart that uh, onto my kids. Be mossier. I like that. And listen, I um, I was reading in your bio, you, you reported for more than 100 countries. I've, I'm one of those people who counts countries. I've been 117. So I was like, ah, oh, Bill and I, you know, <laughs> with these like, but I get it. Like I have caught way back because... At some point, you sort of like, you know, it's it's exciting. And then one day you just, maybe it was a pandemic, but I'm like, oh, getting on a plane and being gone is deeply disruptive, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's a trade-off that one needs to make. It the is moss a trade-off, yeah. Or the no moss. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when I was filming my show, The Wonderless, we shot in 24 different countries and it was the dream job mm. uh, professionally. Like we literally could look at a globe and say, hey, I wonder what's going on in Madagascar and, and go there, you know, and just truly discover. But the trade off of that is I lost my first marriage. Um, you know, it fell apart because I wasn't built at home building community with the same zeal that I was exploring other people's very tight communities. Uh, so, yeah, everything in life is a trade off. So your new book is called Life As We Know It can be, and I, if you're watching the video, you can see I'm doing parenthesis around can be. <laughs> Stories of people, climate, and hope in a changing world. What is the book about for folks so that they go out and buy it? And why, why did you write this book now? Like what was the moment that you're meeting? Well, the moment of inspiration is I became a new old dad mm -hmm. uh, back in 2020 uh, at the height of the pandemic. Uh, 
my partner and I never thought that we she would get pregnant, so it was sort of a, a, a beautiful surprise, and it gave me a new lease, lease on parenthood. My, my daughter is 16 years older. She's now almost 21. And I used her as sort of a yardstick on the wonder list. When I realized that she was going to turn my age in the year 2050, I said, I want to go to the wonders of the world and wonder what will be left of her. And so that was sort of a, a human lifespan as a, as a measurement tool for me. And then when I became a new old dad, and I'm holding this little baby and looking out at a world in lockdown, and I was covering the George Floyd protests at the time, and I'd, be, I'd been the climate reporter really dedicated that for a couple of years so I, every day i was just drinking from this fire hose of peer-reviewed dread uh and i looked at this little bundle and and realized this kid is gonna if all things go well live to see the 22nd century and so i started writing these letters somewhat that were sort of apologies like hey, you know welcome to earth i'm sorry we we broke the sky and the sea and and I'm sorry that a lot of the animals you're falling in love with are endangered. And But then I realized that if I just focused on the dark side of this beat, I was going to, you know, crawl into a bong or something and just never come out. And, and, and then I began covering all these amazing movements in technology and clean energy and met people who have turned their anxiety into action in the most inspiring ways and balanced it out. I was supposed to deliver this book like two years ago, and I'm, I'm horrible, you know, turning in these, you know, long assignments like this. I've been writing for TV every night, but this is a whole different memory set. And, but I'm glad it delayed because enough happened around the world where now I am more engaged and more excited about the possibilities of my son's lifetime. And so it's sort of framed as a letter to him. He's my, I can tell him much more easier. I can talk to my kids and say, don't repeat my mistakes about how I thought about the world much easier than I can write a self-help book and try to preach to the masses. So a little, it's a little bit of a crutch framing it as him. But I didn't just go looking for new ways to think about, you know, clean energy and all of that. I really wanted tools to how to deal with the mental weight of this, of this issue and went back to everyone from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and, and Abraham Maslow, sort of giants of, of psychology, and pulled some tools from there. So it's really a re-examination of Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, in the age of climate change and all the stuff at the bottom of the pyramid, that first, the, the physiological needs that stuff keep us alive, air, water, temperature, and then the safety needs of food and shelter and community. I sort of just worked my way up the pyramid with him, uh, you know, in mind, but also using my own stories and things I've gathered from around the world to just help people sort of rethink their wants and needs. And because ultimately climate change is not a story that will be fixed by innovation or, or even politics. It's really stories. It's the stories we tell ourselves about uh, how we interact with each other and the world and everything around us, you know, flags, borders, currencies, corporations, religions, are really just stories we agree on in the moment, but they're under constant revision. And I think a better story is being written right now. One thing that really fascinates me about what you've done is you have a perspective that a lot of us don't have. Like, you know, a lot of people listen to the show travel. We have people all over the world. But when you hear about climate change, you know, it's the news. And so unless your house gets burned down by the wildfire or gets flooded from the flood, it isn't visceral. But you travel all over the world covering the effects of climate change. So you've seen the firsthand effects. And so we're going to be talking about, obviously, you've, this book is written within the context of a changing climate and what that means for us as human beings and how we're reacting and what that what will, how that will shape our lives. But just for folks who maybe maybe aren't tuning this in right now or just have been like focused on, maybe they're focused on politics, which, I mean, it's related, but it's a whole other set of things. Like, can you just tell us from your vantage point how we can think about climate and and, and sort of just put it into a, into a set of, I guess, words that would that we'd just be able to understand what's really happening out there? Sure. I think because of you know, the way the homo sapien brain evolved, 
we don't think in long time scales. You know, it's why we organize our lives around quarters, you know, whether in business or, or, you know, the next vacation or you live check to check, or we just think in these very small things. And if that is disrupted by it, by any event, a weather event, we tend to think, wow, that was a once in a lifetime one off. I'm glad we got through that, but now the sun's out and everything's back to normal. I think what the average person doesn't appreciate is that the earth that you and I grew up on, this Goldilocks climate, because it's been fluctuating for four and a half billion years for various reasons, wobbles in the earth or super volcanoes or all of that. But now we are the volcano. Uh, humanity is the one affecting things, and the Earth we grew up on is gone. The Goldilocks Earth, we have moved out of that and are moving further out of that, and nobody knows for sure how things work on this new Earth we've built by accident. And the, you can see it in the water cycles, whether there's way too much at once or not enough for decades. We go from mega drought to flash flood, we go from wildfire seasons to year round in some places. And there are certain things that are happening to ocean currents that are only gonna change it more. You can think about vector-borne diseases. There is now tropical diseases like malaria in central Alaska. There are things that just seem unconceivable to us. And human nature is that it will go back to safety but it won't. And it's just a matter of time. And unfortunately, what's happening already, especially in the states where most people want to live in this country, Florida and California, long before, you know, sea level rise is lapping up on the front steps of South Beach hotels, there will be a financial crisis in these places in which Property insurance is impossible to get, which then drives down property values, and that's a tax base that pays your cops and your teachers, and there's this spiral that can happen for those communities that aren't leaning into this, embracing, and trying to be more resilient right now. And so whether you notice it or not, it shows up in your food bill when you can't ship the grain down the Mississippi River because it's too low for several years in a row. The supply chains across the Pacific are, are vulnerable. The Panama Canal right now is jammed up because of drought down there that controls those locks. And so we are in an ever-connected world. When I was coming up in local news, there was a, a consultant came in and said, local, it's all people care about. You're going to grab them at 5, 6, and 11 o'clock with local crime and local punishment and local weather. But 9-11 and COVID and global financial crises is made me realize as I got older that is my town safe and is my planet safe are two are part of the same question and and things are connected in ways that a lot of times we don't appreciate FOMO FOMO yeah there was a luxury just thinking everything was far away because I grew up that way too I'm a small town in Maine and now it's like people are definitely way more connected than they were now what what you do in the book which is you mentioned this a bit before, but you take, you reframe Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which are, as I'm going to read them out, which are um, physiological, safety, love, esteem, and self-actualization. And you use each one of these as a frame to talk about, you know, what's happening in the world, the things that you're seeing, and to pass on, you know, a pretty optimistic message at a time where things don't feel necessarily optimistic at times. I mean, I think we, you know, it's like, I guess if you don't read the news, maybe you're feeling a bit more cheery, but the minute you turn on the news, it's just, there's a lot happening that's, that's very disconcerting. And we've been riding this wave of instability for a while. So I want to make this a good news, you know, within, you know, tempered good news. Like, let's be realistic. Like you're, you're sure. a journalist, so you're not here to be, you know, Pollyanna. Um, but I would love to just take on some of these layers and hear what you learn and how you're thinking about these things. So let's start right at the bottom of the pyramid with physiological. You know, what does that mean in terms of the, the framing of the book? And then what do you talk about that we can that we can learn from? Well, it started when I just kind of fell in love with Abraham Maslow, who was this amazing story. He's the oldest of seven kids of uh, Ukrainian immigrants, came from this completely miserable family. 
hated his mother. She was so cruel, he would describe to his friends and all of that. Sort of a Freudian nightmare. But he became obsessed with human motivation. And at a time when, when, when psychology was basically, you know, the Freudian psychotherapists who say you are the product of your parents, you know, unmet needs. And then the behavioralists were like, we're rats in a maze, just sort of pushing levers for treats. And he said, no, we're more, we're more than that. that. That humans aren't, you know, birthed as lumps of clay that become either cannibals or CEOs, but we're like bits of scaffolding that are joined together and be built upon uh, over time. Humanism, he's like, we are human and that's okay. And it's messy and it's all the above. And in 1943, he wrote a theory on human motivation, which completely scrambled the, the, the field, added a whole new lane of thinking about our, our mental state. And it was never really took the shape of a pyramid, but that was, you know, in his writings. But that's the way it is. We think about uh, the shape of it. And he acknowledges in this paper, this is written at a time of peaceful abundance because emergency conditions are by large rare in a place like the United States. And this is 1943, right? And so a couple of years later, Adolf Hitler tries to fill his perverted esteem needs, you know, by tearing across Europe. And Maslow had this epiphany where he was watching a parade after Pearl Harbor and just started crying, thinking about if we could only come create a peace table for humanity and sit there and discuss our wants and needs. He thought if people could fulfill the, all their basic needs and then the top we could we could unite around this so i just sort of fell in love with his ideas and at the very bottom uh you know think about it as, as sort of a five-story pyramid the level one is all just the stuff that keeps you alive it's it's oxygen and protein and calcium and certain minerals you know it's excretion and sleep and if if you don't meet these needs nothing else matters uh, right there, right? And then sort of once the belly is full and you're alive, you need the security needs of le level two. And that's shelter, and that's uh, rule of law, that's energy, information is a, is a safety need. Um, this is where our sort of where our governments are built around to meet the safety needs of the public. And then once those basic needs are, are met, you know, sort of the, the belly's full and the door is barred, then you want to belong to a lover or a, a pickleball club or a mob descending on the capital for better or worse. We meet a lot of our needs and the love needs. Once you, if you have enough of that, people then level up to level four, which is the esteem needs, the respect of your peers, the promotion, the awards. This is the, where we practice our Oscar speeches, you know, in the mirror, uh, holding a comb. And then if you meet all of those needs and, and they don't have to level up in order, it can be nonlinear, you're satisfied in some, dissatisfied in others, at the very top, self-actualization, as he called it, was the, like, the best you can be. Whatever you're meant to be, you should be. And, um, you know, hippies took this as license to follow their bliss from Woodstock mud into the boardrooms as boomers. A lot of marketers took this, and instead of building peace tables, they built, you know, sales plans and could sell to people based on different needs. You don't just need a car for your safety needs. You need it for your love and your esteem needs. And you can't be self-actualized unless you buy this model. And so I grew up with sort of that, like thinking about the top of my pyramid as if I just get on TV, uh, then I'll be reached self-actualization. And then once you get on TV, well, if I just go to a bigger market, <laughs> you know. And so I've been going up this chasing the top of my pyramid all these, these years. But now that we can't take the stuff at the bottom for granted anymore. Now when you can, you know, when most of the big cities in the United States, their air is clouded by Canadian wildfire smoke or whether you live in California and you're, you're sort of going through this water whiplash where it's drought to, you know, flash flood and no way to manage either side because the world wasn't built that way. We have to start thinking about this stuff and, and connecting with each other on it. And the people who are already there, I think the people who are already connecting either as entrepreneurs thinking about clean water tech, like some guys I met and you know, talked to in India who were lab partners at MIT. One of them you know, grew up hauling water with a bucket. Well, they figured out a way to clean the dirtiest water from the most polluting industries you know, from semiconductor prefabs, pharmaceutical plants, and their suite of technology can recycle 98% of the water 
like, you know, think about millions and millions of gallons a week that aren't being pulled from nature and then dumped, polluted. And I just started looking for those solutions as, as inspiration points. And there's so much out there that, that doesn't get talked about. I try to connect the dots, you know, when I'm uh, doing a live shot about Canadian wildfire smoke to say, this has a lot to do with the, the air we can't see, the carbon dioxide and the methane that is overheating our planet. And these things are related, but I'm a lonely voice <laughs> trying to connect those dots these days. And so I just, this is less um, a prescription for, here's how you have to, you know, ride a scooter to work and live in a yurt. It's not that anymore. We now have, have advanced so much in terms of uh, building science, food systems, regenerative agriculture. There are ways to make a much healthier, holistic decisions that, that not only create wealth for whoever is in that space, but a more resilient community for the rest of us. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how I, I use Maslow there. I like it. And it makes a ton of sense because you, I, mean, I think about, I mean, not to hammer on about the pandemic, but it's sort of like, you could have all the money you wanted. You could have all the affirmation you wanted, but when the pandemic hit, you know, if you got COVID and you didn't, you know, you didn't make it through, it didn't matter. Or you couldn't leave your house. So we, all of us became very vulnerable in a way that I think, you know, there have been those moments of vulnerability in global culture, whether it's for Americans, 9-11, whether it's for, you know, certain Ukrainians, the, the, the war there, Israel and Palestine right now. I mean, you see all of these these societies that were perfectly functioning look good from the outside. Everybody has problems, of course, but then something happens and all of a sudden self-actualization is deemed, and, you know, those feel like luxury goods, right? Because the the bottom has been pulled out from you. I'm curious when it comes to some of the stuff around climate, is it, I mean, <laughs> there is no one solution, obviously. You just mentioned some bottoms up solutions with entrepreneurs and like in a perfect world where, you know, all the market capitalists just think that capital is going to flow to the best solutions and the market will solve these problems. If that were true, we'd probably be in a different spot. But there is a bottoms up part to this where entrepreneurs, capital, creativity, problem solvers all over the world start to address these issues from the, you know, from the bottom up, where all of us as individuals, as consumers, make better decisions about how we spend our time, money, and energy. But then there's a top-down element where like our governments, which oftentimes don't feel very functional these days, need to come together to provide frameworks where, you know, we all agree that we're going to do better as you, I mean, and it feels totally unaddressable, frankly. How do you think about it? Because, because you, you, you spend your, you, you know, so much time thinking about this and talking to people and in this book, you are coming at it from a solutions framework. Like how, how do you kind of think through this, this challenge? I think that thinking about it from top down and unfortunately that's kind of the way we're conditioned mm -hmm. is to think about, you know, orient our our year or every four years around a presidential campaign, and that's whereas I really think that the the some of the greatest works, the great the hard fought yards, are happening at the local level, at the utility level, at the water board level, and and that to me is a much more empowering place for folks to be able to connect and feel like they're doing something and can actually do something. Uh, in ways that add up in, in little bits, right? And and you can think about, I think it's Gary Vaynerchuk who has the jab, jab, punch uh, philosophy where you take a lot of little jabs, not thinking, what is this doing? How is this helping? And then you realize that leads up to the big change, the haymaker that, that you know, does something new or exciting for your community you didn't think was possible, that was, you know, trapped in the past. Um, yeah, I mean, look, there, I just saw a story uh, today about how a company is now taking the 2,000-year-old Jesus ice, as they call it. This is ice in Greenland that formed, you know, during the Roman Empire and has been frozen ever since. Tons of that are now shedding off of Greenland. And a lot of people would see that as, as a huge, massive problem for the planet. But a few people see that as an opportunity to charge more for a cocktail. So they are shipping this old ice to Dubai to, you know, to put in drinks in, 
ritzy bars there, right? And so the, the profit motive that got us sort of into these problems without any regard for the cost, without any sensitivity to the, to the bottom of other people's pyramids that, you know, as you're extracting whatever it is your, your company produces with no regard for that, I think that's changing. I think the consumers are changing that. I think that there's a whole generation of folks you, you had a guest on your pod recently I was listening to, sort of the expert on the, the paradox of choice and, and the tyranny of having too many options. I look at it now as there's, there are much fewer options if you want to orient your life around companies and products that are doing more good than harm and that are prioritizing the same values. Um, and those people are being rewarded. And I think there are now... I've met some of these people who are the trillionaires of tomorrow in industries like carbon capture and thermal batteries and all these ideas that people really aren't talking about at the cocktail party level yet, but are going to be massive. Um, there's so many ways to improve the things that we take for granted. There's so much excessive waste built into the pyramids in, of my youth that just by removing those, you don't notice a hit in lifestyle, right? And, and yeah, it's easy to sort of bog down in the policy and the political fights, and that matters. It absolutely matters. But, you know, I'm trying to encourage my kids to be good civic-minded citizens and just focus on what's around them, you know, and, and, and connect with people around those. I think regardless of party, everybody can agree on a favorite hiking trail or a favorite if you're a bird you know, a duck hunter, a fisherman, regardless, you care about things, you notice the changes. And a couple, in 2022, if you had asked the average American, ask them, I want you to guess the percentage of your fellow countrymen and women who care about climate and support action around it. Most people would guess between 33 and 42 percent. In reality, it's 66 to 80 percent. It's pluralistic ignorance is the term. We assume the worst. And as a result, nobody wants to talk about this stuff. Nobody wants to be the buzzkill to bring up climate change, even when you can taste the air, you know, during wildfire season or something. But it's vital to connect with, with people who share that anxiety. And maybe together you turn it into action at, the, at your local school board level, at your local utility level, at, at you know, your homeowners association just not, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to use the terms climate change that, that are so politically loaded. It could be about resilience. It could be about, hey, are we protected? You know, what are, what's our evacuation route? What are the most common things that can uh, threaten us? And FEMA recently did a study where they evaluated communities, not just on how close they were to the coast or how, you know, or, or how deep they were in the, in the wilderness in terms of wildfires, but church membership, um, the you know, internet connectivity, uh, voting rolls, uh, robustness of the public libraries, and they, they can determine that communities that are on the coast are actually more resilient and stronger and will get better insurance policies than some that are 50 miles inland where the people just don't trust each other and aren't engaged in what's happening there. So... I think about it really at that level and, and just hope for the best on sort of the geopolitical level because you never know. You know, Vladimir Putin changed natural gas fortunes with one swoop. And, and this, those kinds of things will continue to happen. But there's, we have so much agency in the world around us and added up, all of those, massive change. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah, and if you believe in the talent in our world. It's like, I, I, oftentimes when people will say to me, listen, my, you know, I'm looking for a job. My, um, my company is going through problems. We were some startup that was sending dog food through the internet and guess what? The venture capital ran out or whatever. It's like, okay, yeah, you can go work for some AI company. That's the hot place in the market right now. And, 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 and that's fine. But AI without a functioning climate is not going to do you all that much good. The climate economy, the venture capital, the startups, all of the things that are going to happen in that space, because of course that is going to become the number one priority of everybody. 
It's not going to be some sort of nice to have. It's going to be a an, a binary kind of thing. And so the amount of investment and attention, you know, just like, you know, these movies like Deep Impact or whatever, where it's like there's a comet racing towards Earth and we've got to like figure out, everybody's going to be focused on this. So if you are looking for your next act in your career, this is the place to be. And this is where the Absolutely. capital will flow and the talent will flow. And... I think your soul will be <laughs> will be better for it. I, you know, I I I, I don't want to get out over my skis there, but you could fit the decision makers, the C sweeters, from the seventy five biggest monster polluters, you know, around the world in petro states, into a couple of Greyhound buses, you know, and those folks are surrounded by people who don't want, certainly don't want to talk about whether the business model is doing more harm than good. But I got to feel like they know these are smart folks and they understand. And um, and whether it's nibbling around the edges, or whether it's nudging a, a, a legacy company in, in a better direction from inside, that's hugely powerful, I, I think. But if, if as my kid was coming out of college now, you know, I have a daughter who loves performing arts and she's she's studying musical theater and. I completely support that. I'm not trying to convince her to <laughs> to be a you know marine ecologist or something like that. Um, but my only ask is that she devotes some of that talent towards a bigger cause, um, because in the end, Abraham Maslow figured out right before he died that his ideas around self actualization were all clunky. You know, because he had people coming to him and saying, uh, "Well, isn't?" Hitler self-actualized as the best monster he could be, you know, and then they started picking it apart. And he completely reevaluated his theory and realized that the self-actualized, the most successful, the mentally healthiest among us, it wasn't about them meeting selfish goals. It was transcendence of self. It was being in service to certain values like truth and beauty and harmony and humor and you can see it in the people you admire that these values are as much a part of them as their spleen, uh, you know, or their liver. And a lawyer who is committed to truth and justice, that they have to do that, right? And, and I, I just encourage folks to tap into that, that sensibility. And you talk about AI, it's people so terrified, but this tool, I mean, talk about, I, I've talked to scientists who use AI to census penguins in, in Antarctica to figure out nuclear fusion uh, in a much more, in a way that never could have happened with our previous capacity. They're going to use it to, you know, there's a new satellite going up on Monday that will track methane super polluters around the world to understand exactly where the most egregious uh, sort of planet cooking pollution is coming from and figure out smart ways to to stop it. it it's hugely exciting, but just like anything else, right? A, a blade or a flame can either heal you in the hands of a surgeon or, or burn your house down or take your wallet, you know? And um, I, I think there's so much potential for this this crop of folks who just get looking for a way to start careers and doing things that literally... You know, that's the thing I say in the book is that you want to fill your love and esteem needs in a trend, in a way that will far surpass any yoga retreat or vacation you can pay for. Try guaranteeing a clean sip of air and water for every living thing forever. That's that's a legacy. Even better that. than kombucha, everybody. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> All right, Bill, are you ready for our lightning round? Absolutely. I love you just like perfectly teed up. You know, you hit everything. Uh, you're a pro. All right. Lightning round. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> All right. Here's we got four questions. The first okay. one is what's a favorite quote? Ooh. Um, my favorite quote is from Mr. Rogers, who said, when you see a scary event on TV, look for the helpers. He, he tells kids who they see, a, you know, a bomb goes off or there's a wildfire on TV and it's very scary to watch. Look for their help. There's always helpers. There's always people rushing into those places. I'm lucky enough to meet them now out, out of my reporting work. Uh, so every day I say to my little boy, be a helper. Yeah, that's a great quote. All right. Number two, 
Name one book or podcast that every FOMO sapiens should know about. Not one of your own, though. <laughs> um, that's a good one. And I could go recent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, because I actually reference her work in my book, I went and, and sort of deeply into the story of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who gave us the five stages of grief. And she entered the medical field at a time when 95% of doctors would not tell terminal patients that they had cancer. And she invented basically hospice care by interviewing thousands of people who were terminal and trying to understand what they're going through and wrote the book On Death and Dying, which was a seismic change the way we think about things. I use it in the climate space that when like what's happening you know, pick a natural disaster around the world. Those people are cycling through the five stages of grief, denial, um, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And it, it can happen in nonlinear ways. The, the closer we get to acceptance, even if you've lost everything, that's where the healing begins. That's where the rebuilding begins. And the people who are able to get there sooner can pick up the neighbors around them. So I'm going to throw out uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Yeah, I like that a lot. And, and taking that and using it as a way to examine something else is is a novel idea. Number three, what's one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self? I would say, a younger. Th what advice would I give to my younger self? I've been so lucky to just have this, this circuitous career that is so non-traditional. And... I never really sweated it. I was raised by this crazy woman who, who gave me a courage to constantly reinvent and move around a lot. So it wouldn't be your typical, like, enjoy the ride kind of stuff, because I kind of did that. Um, I guess I would say, tell myself to focus on others sooner. F figure out the power of, you know, early on in my career, I used storytelling just because I was trying to fill my esteem needs and either become David Letterman or, or Peter Jennings. Those are my two heroes. And it wasn't until I realized that by turning that, that sort of narcissism outward and mining and understanding the stories of others and just by doing honoring their stories and doing the best I could at, at telling the, the little stories that affect the most life, um, I would say get there sooner because it, it, it happened rather late. I like me. that a lot. Uh, okay. I, I usually only do four. I'm going to put a bonus at the end, but let's do four first. Bonus just okay. for you. Number four is what's your most important memory? Wow. Uh, it's a light one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I would probably say, I mean, I was very close with my dad. And so I would say canoeing the boundary waters with my old man, uh, who was the smartest high school dropout I ever met, a brilliant sort of amateur geologist, historian, naturalist, uh, who used to, who instilled in me this, this wonder of, of the natural world and all the places we would climb or backpack or canoe. But he always said, and just wait, some a-hole is going to come ruin this and here's how it's going to happen. So, so he gave me this sense of, you know, treasure what's around you, but you got to fight to keep it this way. And it's, you know, if we're not careful, the places we all agree are the most special can be, can be lost. All right. Final one. This is special for you designed by me, which is what is the most difficult to get to country you have reported from or place? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the, the most difficult to get to uh, would have been either Kiribati in the South Pacific, tiny little island nation, or Vanuatu is another one in the, in the South Pacific. It just takes forever to get there, but they're just gorgeous, fascinating places. I was just in Antarctica for a, for a special on whale scientists, and you got to cross the Drake Passage, but that was fun. That wasn't a big, you know, that wasn't a big deal. Um, but the most difficult otherwise would either be, I was the first reporter to, to do a live shot from Tibet as China was just trying to open up 
Uh, so I, I did a live shot for Good Morning America from the Patala Palace, and we had to buy a truck and build a satellite truck from scratch because there was no other capability. And there were there were sort of Chinese minders surrounding us who didn't want us to say the words Dalai Lama while while standing in front of the palace of all the Dalai Lamas. And so wrestling with Chinese censors there was very difficult. Uh, and then covering the war in Afghanistan, I was I was with the first infantry way up in the mountains on the on the Pakistan border in the, the Kunar. Pesh Valley and, and saw them under fire a few times and you know for somebody from the outside it seems exciting but to see what what our troops really live with and, and understand the people who live there and what they were going through as well uh, I still it is difficult to think back on you know I have to tell you of that f- five that you've listed i've only been to tibet and i feel like i'm well traveled and while war doesn't give me fomo the ability to go to these places in the way you have definitely drives me into a fomo <laughs> zone so yeah i'm putting that on you i'm see. very lucky i wish i could share my my passport and my expense report you know <laughs> well you share your journalism with so that's a everybody <laughs> all right uh the book is called Life As We Know It Can Be, Stories of People, Climate, and Hope in a Changing World. If you want to find out more about Bill's work, you can find him on both Twitter, some people call it X, we still call it Twitter, and Instagram, at Bill Ware, CNN. Bill Ware, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure, Patrick. It was really a thrill. I had FOMO of of never being invited on this podcast, but I don't have it anymore. (laughs) (laughs) FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.